Oh boy, a bright, bright, shiny moon out there. Look at the craters, the dark lava flows that once were bubbling billions of years ago. Hello everybody, I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us today to stay curious as the American Space Museum brings you a video podcast Monday through Fridays where we celebrate space history, astronaut birthdays, and of course, lots of astronomy because that's my love. I've been an amateur astronomer since a little boy, and 50 years later, I still get turned on by the moon. And though I love moonshine, I get all I can. It's the kind of moonshine you can't get too much of, and you're going to get a lot of it today as we talk about some interesting aspects about La Luna, as the Romans called it. We just call it moon here, most of the populace on Earth do. Uh, particularly Americans, though there's 171 other moons in the solar system that have names to them. Our moon is just moon. And I'll share a little bit more about that with you here as we try to inspire you with the moon to to do what we're going to show today. Write some, uh, Take some photographs, write some poetry, make a drawing, do a watercolor, maybe write a short story about the moon that is so dominant to human beings as that is our closest celestial neighbor, 240,000 miles away, and only 12 to only six times have humans landed on it the last time 50 years ago. So we'll get your lunacy caps on and let's look at the moon a little bit. Did want to give a shout out to a couple people that were following us over the weekend. Thank you, John Bisney and Al Kohler, Leslie Day, Steve Kane. David Rich, Eileen Dix, and Corey Skinner for liking some of our posts over the holiday weekend. And this gorgeous, gorgeous shot, I need to look in this direction, of the moon is uh, courtesy of astronomy buddy Steve Rissmiller, who just lives about 10 miles from our American Space Museum in downtown Titusville. What a gorgeous exposure that is, showing you the raid crater Tycho. That's the one where all the rays are coming out of it right there. That's Tycho, and we're going to show you maybe the man in the moon, you see. But before the end of today's show, you're definitely going to look at the moon and see the woman in the moon, which I've always seen. I've never seen the man in the moon, because uh, the woman in the moon I see has got nice uh, long hair. Anyway, let's uh, say hello to Marty Winkle, my co-producer for over two years as we are now in our 720 something episode and we've got connie mcdaniel is working the stream labs computer program today learning it as she's one of our ace volunteers here for the last three years and is going to learn stream labs stay curious program so marty can get a break once in a while thank you for all you do connie so uh let's kick it off here with the man that probably turned me onto the moon in the 1960s when I was just a little bitty boy is Walt Disney. And I saw this and I probably went bonkers thinking I've got to see craters on the moon. And when I was eight years old for Christmas that year in Finley, Ohio, I got a J.C. Penney's 90 millimeter refractor, I mean, uh, telescope. And I wore that thing out. In fact, I thought instead of charging, uh, making a lemonade stand at summertime, I tried to make a telescope viewing stand. One, people didn't let their kids stay out that late to look at stuff at night in the summertime. And two, I just wanted to give it away. I couldn't take people's nickels and dimes to look at the rings of Saturn. I wanted everyone to see it, and I still do. So, But Walt Disney had a tremendous program back in the early 60s. Uh, on his every Sunday night, you would watch Walt Disney, and then the, the Ed Sullivan show would be on afterwards. A family routine for millions of us baby boomers out there. But I know for a fact I had to got hooked on by seeing Walt Disney himself pointing at this globe of the moon. So we hope that you're inspired by something about our moon. It's 2,160 miles wide. It's the fifth largest natural satellite in the entire solar system. Uh, the lar uh, It's actually larger than the dwarf planet Pluto by just about 50 or 60 miles. Uh, the ratio of the Earth to the moon is 1 to 4, meaning 
uh, the moon is one fourth the size of the earth. That is the largest ratio of any two bodies orbiting each other in the solar system, making the earth moon a binary system. They don't actually, the moon doesn't actually orbit around the center of the earth. It's somewhere about a thousand miles deep into the uh, surface is where the, the actual epicenter of this is. Um, so, and of course, at no time in history were we more fixed on the moon than 53 years ago with the Apollo 11 landings on the moon. But even today, being a, a young boy growing up uh, crazy about the moon and learning my telescope, after all, we're talking about backyard astronomy today on Stay Curious, Stay Star Curious. Um, the best way to get to learn learn how to use any telescope, whether you just got it or it's been in the shed or in the garage for years and you finally get uh, hankering to learn how to use it, the moon is your best object to learn how it moves. You'll find out ways that you need to maybe tighten up some parts of it and so forth. So get out, get your little moonshine because this Friday it's going to be full moon. Full moon's rising about 526 on the Space Coast, wow, people are driving home from work watching the full moon rise. Um, but it is spectacular any time you see it rising over the ocean or, or mountains uh, with buildings in the foreground, you get an illusion that it looks bigger, and that's the moon illusion. However, you can always cover up the moon with your little pinky at your arm stretch, outstretched arm because it's a half a degree across. Well, let's say goodbye to Walt Disney, and you cannot underestimate how this man has changed the thinking of Americans on so many things, including space travel. He certainly did mine. But any time I see the moon rising, like this moon rise over one of the beautiful hotels uh, that's down by Satellite Beach area, uh, I have to look up at it. It's just it's just an amazing sight. And you'll always see when it's rising that little oval at the top. That's Merchrism. And I'll mention a couple times that I'm fussy about Hollywood and movies and, and um, marketing firms that use the moon upside down. Sometimes it's flipped around left to right. I've even seen an Apollo image taken by Apollo 10 orbiting the moon when they came away that is used as a moonrise. And it doesn't, you can tell that one easily because it doesn't have all the Maria, the dark areas. The dark areas are Maria. That's where uh, lava once flowed, about the consistency of uh, not of a 10 weight motor oil, all right? Um, and then the impacts over billions and billions of years have carved out this face of the moon on these. So, but the people who've always been looking at the moon, of course, are our ancestors. And the Native American ancestors of the American plains certainly had many myths and legends associated with the moon. There you see a bison uh, made out of the moon's dark areas there. And the myths and legends of the Na Native Americans, I love telling. I love telling any cultures about their their legends of the, the constellations and their beliefs of uh, star patterns and, and other things they see in the sky. But because we are in America, that's what we know dearest and hear the most are the Native Americans on our country. And their legends are deep and strong. Uh, the moon played a huge part in the psyche of the rituals of all peoples on the earth, and Native Americans were no exception. And of course, as you saw, the phases of the moon change. When In a period of time under 30 days, that's where our calendars were created, as it went from about 30 days from one phase to the other. And they called them the months is another Latin word for moon, mons, moon, okay? Many moons. The, the Native Americans kept track of time, not so much by the sun, but by the number of full moons going on. The Chinese did that too. In other cultures, they use as their, as their calendar the moon cycle, not our 365-day orbit around the moon. So we love talking about on the, uh, of course, and there's several anomalies when we talk about the moon. One is I'm calling it the moon. I don't say the Mars when I'm talking about Mars. 
I don't say, well, there's the Venus is in the uh, western sky right after sunset. It isn't that odd that we always put the in front of when we say Earth and when we say moon. But I don't say, oh, directly overhead at nine o'clock tonight is the Jupiter. All right. No, it's Jupiter. All right. And Mars is rising in the, the east, as we've been telling you. So here's the moon in its phases. And I said moon, the moon again. And when it's a crescent moon, that is the, the crescent phases with the horns uh, that the natives called it. Uh, of course, the full moon or the and the gibbous moon is when it's not full. Gibbous would be the, the third from the right and the second from the bottom. And then you got the quarter phases where they call them first quarter and last quarter. Or sometimes it's called first quarter and third quarter. All right. Uh, but when you're seeing a quarter moon there, the other half to the right side or the left side is fully lit also. All right. We just don't see what we call the back side of the moon. We'll talk about that in a second. What we love talking about and sharing in about the moon is the names that the full moon is given by Native Americans. And there you have them for the full year. The January moon is the wolf moon. Why is it called the wolf moon, you ask? Well, wolves were baying in the distance 300 years ago when Native Americans were all over our Great Plains. And they, they were baying because they were hungry. They were starving. Uh, looking for food and crying that they were hungry because uh, with the foliage falling down and and bushes and so forth were didn't have leaves on them it was harder to find food because the uh, uh, they would run quickly uh, it was cold and the, their food source was hiding okay well as we go through the, the months of the year uh, briefly, I'll just say February is the snow moon. Okay, duh. Uh, it's, then these moons are called other things in other cultures or also by other Native American tribes. Uh, the warm moon is usually March because worms are coming out of the ground. The pink full moon of, of April is such because there's a lot of pink flowers like flocks everywhere. Pink was a major color uh, uh, in the West of, of colorful um, items, uh, colorful flowers. Then they call it the flower moon, all right, for uh, May. June is the strawberry moon. July is the buck moon because that's when uh, buck uh, deer and other big animals like that were mating. And uh, I love that August is the sturgeon moon. That's named for the Great Lakes where the sturgeon just were so easy to catch. And then, of course, we get into tradition. Uh, everyone knows that um, September is can be the green corn moon. And the full moon of October is the hunter moon and uh, or the harvest moon. It, it can be the corn moon or the harvest moon, depending when it's at the beginning or end of the month. The beaver moon of November is because beavers finish building their facilities and start living in them. And then in December is the cold moon in there. The moon of December is also called the Yule moon. And they all have different names. The beaver moon there, that reminds me of Bucky's. Uh, one of my favorite places to stop when I'm traveling. And if you've got a Bucky's on your highway where you go, you better stop by and, and get you some of that good uh, barbecue they have there. So we could call that the Bucky's moon. You can call it whatever you want because you know what? You own the moon. Nobody owns the moon. You can call things what you want. You could rename every crater on it if you want. Now, the International Astronomical Union would not recognize that, but that's okay. You're not going to force it on the scientists of the world to call uh, this crater uh, Winkle Crater. All right. But... Um, uh, I might do that in my own uh, mind, all right? And that's perfectly okay. Well, what else have we got to share on our moons today? Is uh, There we go. The wolf moon is of January, a nice silhouette of a howling moon there. And like I said, it was because they were baying in the middle of the night because they were hungry. And with one of the other 
wolves knew where he was or she was, maybe they'd share some of their 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 food. Well, let's look at a couple other things about the moon. Like, what is once in a blue moon? All right, here's a blue moon I photographed very recently. Not, of course, I just tinted one of my photos of the moon, which, by the way, I've taken almost all these photos that you've seen. It'll be obvious the ones that I did not by lunar orbiting spacecraft. But uh, there's a classic shot of the moon, the blue moon. Once in a blue moon, what does that mean? That's like... Um, saying uh uh marty i'll buy you lunch once in a blue moon okay okay he says well a blue moon technically that's a rare event and that's when there's two full moons in the same month and because the moon is 29 and a half day cycle yes on the first of the month you could have a full moon and then you could have a full moon on the 30th of the month two full moons and that happens with rather frequency usually there's rarely a year that we don't have two full moons in the same month all right and i think this year october could be one that we have two full moons in a month actually it's four full moons in a quarter in a three month period is the technical term for it but still once in a blue moon and why did they, they that phrase become? Because I've never seen a blue moon with my own eyes unless I photoshopped it. So I don't know. But it's just a, I guess because you'll never see the moon blue, right, Marty? So you'll never see the moon blue. You might see it reddish. You might see it yellowish. But you'll never see it blue. So once in a blue moon, I'm going to buy Marty lunch. And to give you an idea of the size we're talking about, La Luna, moon is a little over 2,000 miles. Mars is a little over 4,000. And Earth is just under 8,000. So basically, you have 8, 4, and 2,000 miles across right there. A beautiful ratio. And I love pointing out the size of Mars is half that of Earth because it's so big in our minds with all the science fiction and all the dreams of going there. And yet, it's half the size of Earth. Pretty small world, actually. Well, there's my late buddy, Farrell Snyder, looking at the moon as a crescent, just a, a day or two old. And that's what astronomers call the moon. If you would say, Mark, the moon is uh, seven days old today, I would say it's first quarter. All right. 28, 29 days for a full cycle of the moon. So seven days is one quarter of its uh, cycle. So so they start with new moon is zero days, and then when you can just see it's one day old. This would probably be about a three-day, two-day-old moon right there, where you can just barely see it. Horns are going to be up when it's in the west at sunset. If you see a west uh, a, a sunset scene and they got the horns pointing down, that's wrong, man. Horns are pointing down in the morning sky. All right. So sometimes you'll see the moon in the sky when it's impossible to be at that part of the sky at that time of day. It's just physics. And by, we all know you cannot change the laws of physics. So, um, but this is a type of photos I like taking. Nice silhouette, beautiful moon. A great memory of a good friend of mine that passed away uh, a few years ago. God bless you, Farrell. There is a beautiful at least I think so, photographs through one of my telescopes of the crescent moon. They're along the craters. The, the, the line between night and day is called the Terminator. It has nothing to do with Arnold Schwarzenegger, okay? It is the night and day uh, differential, and that is on Earth. We call it twilight. We call it evening twilight and morning twilight. And so it's no different watching the Earth except on the moon, there's no city lights because we don't have settlements there yet. Uh, the earth is, is full of, of lights at night. Well, I want you to look at this photograph just for a second. Because this is the four quadrants of the moon. On the left, top left, that's how we see the moon since antiqu antiquity. All right, Human beings have not seen these other four views of the moon, three views of the moon. Those are satellite images, all right? So the one at the far below it, the top left corner, that is our full moon, the way we're used to seeing it. And at the bottom left, that is the backside of the moon. Now, on the top uh, right and bottom right are if, if we turn the moon, and I'll use my, my moon globe here to demonstrate. If we turn the moon quarter, 
uh, turn, all right? And that's so bright, you can't hardly see the surfaces there. But if I'm facing the moon like this, I'm going one quarter turn to, to the left, all right? And if we did that, look at what we see. The top, we see some of the dark areas, all right? But it's clear that the back side of the moon doesn't have these dark lava. In fact, we have the lava on the side facing the Earth because, yes, the Earth's gravity pushed, pulled that oozy lava out to, to fill up these basins that were obviously these big basins were impacts from meteorite strikes that got filled in. So, but I want you to look at this image here on the, uh, the bottom right, uh, uh, just to the left of me there. This is the earth, tur the moon turned around and we're seeing its left side. When you see the moon tonight, the far left side, if you could turn it a quarter turn, this is what you would see. And see that object at the bottom down there? It looks like an eyeball looking at us. Now, the dark area on the right of the moon you're seeing is, is a, a ocean is Priscillium, the Sea of Storms. It's a, the, and that's on the far left, on the top left picture. But if we had moon had been frozen in a different position, so to speak, towards the earth, that eyeball would be pointing at us. You'd have a whole different culture and, and mythologies, all right, based on what they saw in those dark areas, the ancient peoples. And what they did see was all kinds of animals, rabbits, all right, bisons, uh, top left is a rabbit, uh, a, a jackrabbit type of thing. You see a, a bison in the upper right. Uh, a lot of rabbits are, are seen easily uh, pointing out the dark areas and connecting them on the moon. Oh, yeah, I'm going to show you the same dark areas of the moon, how I perceive them every night I see them. There's a uh, creature on the lower left. Not sure what that is, a dog with big ears maybe. Uh, but the man in the moon, I just never really seen the man in the moon because when I look at the gibbous moon like this, I see the woman in the moon, all right? I see a profile of a woman, her hair's in a bun, all right? As I go back and forth like that, oh, wait a second, what happened? Oh, that one's upside down, doggone it. No wonder that doesn't relate right. How'd that get flipped around? All right, that doesn't work, but I got another one there. See her, her Tycho crater at the bottom is her necklace. There we go. We see it like this, don't you? One, two, three. There's the woman in the moon, her profile. See that, Marty? She's even got blue eyes. All right. And uh, so that's just my interpretation of the woman in the moon. All right. And there we go again. Uh, that is actually her hair. At the top is uh, the Sea of Serenity, and uh, uh, Mare Tranquility is in the middle there. Her bun on the right is the Mare Chrysium, and uh, you've got the uh, lower left hand uh, where her hair is at the bottom is the Sea of Nectar. Just think of that concept, a Sea of Nectar. I'd love to swim in that and just uh, see what that felt like, wouldn't you? Maybe not. Well, Galileo also was the first man to take a, a, a telescope and look at the moon. And uh, this was the sketches that Galileo did in 1609, 413 years ago. This January, Galileo made these sketches, all right? And I showed these to encourage you to own the moon if you're artistically inclined at all and make some sketches of what you see, either with your naked eye, maybe a whole landscape illuminated by moonshine. Maybe you're thinking of putting your telescope on there and making a few sketches like Galileo did uh, of the whole moon, or maybe or you can do that with binoculars. And it doesn't have to be accurate, and it could be abstract, it could be whatever you want uh, in there. But uh, I enjoy that myself, find it very relaxing to sketch the moon as I see it. Uh, through my telescope, this is a sketch of uh, uh, a uh, mere iridium, the sea, the bay of rainbows right there. All right, that I sketched with a little little rill there and a few craters in the smooth area. Uh, just something that I enjoy doing. Don't profess to to say it's any piece of great artwork, but I do love capturing the the shadows 
of these mountain peaks as they are catching sunlight in the early morning and throws it on the the sun throws those shadows on the flat surface of the moon there. It can be very dramatic, fun, even sometimes tedious to sketch, all right? But very rewarding as, as uh, I get the satisfaction that I created something out of the moon. And photography, of course, uh, most people that get a telescope eventually do some sort of photography. But all the places on the moon are named, all right? And here's a photograph I took of the moon, and then I put names of the craters on it, all right? There is a sea of, of vapors in the middle, all right? Manilis uh, is the crater on the, the right of there. Uh, Apennine Mountains are 15,000 feet. Uh, I have Manilis there, it's 25 miles wide. All right, see the center, and you see Manilis in the center to the right. That's 25 miles wide. Now, very few craters in the moon are 60 miles. For some reason, that's about the biggest ones we see. But there's a whole lot of them, 30 to 35 miles. You got the Central Bay, uh, Trisnecker there at the bottom is a little bit of a real situation. And when they named the features on the moon, the early uh, stargazers, moon gazers, telescope gazers, named them after mountains and features on Earth, and of course named them after uh, figures of history on Earth, mostly men. Uh, so you got the Apennine Mountains are 15,000 feet tall, and those are some of the tallest on the moon, a little over three miles. And there you've got the Marsh of Decay, which is called the Putrid, uh, Palace Putridus is what the Marsh of Decay is up there at the top. So uh, I enjoy learning the names of the craters on the moon. Uh, there's a lot to learn and, and not, to, uh, not so much that it makes great uh, happy hour talk or, or, or dinner conversation around a dinner table because I start throwing out Sea of Vapors and Manilis is 25 miles wide and, and uh, the Apennine Mountains are three miles high. Uh, people are going to be uh, putting their forks down and heading <laughs> out the door for, for dessert, maybe. But uh, no, you can have a lot of fun. I'm poking fun at myself because uh, a lot of people are very interested in astronomy. And when you're sharing it with them, just don't get too deep with them about it. Keep it light and simple, like hopefully we hear on Stay Curious today. I wanted to point out that your local library and, of course, your uh, Amazon Smile account with our museum as your favorite nonprofit. There's a couple great books. Patrick Moore, this is a book from the 60s. Uh, this is another book from the 70s by Dover Printing. Uh, they have a group of just dozens and dozens of photographs in there to tell you what you're looking at, named features. All right. Some are very famous and easy to find, but they tell you all about them. Uh, particularly Patrick Moore, who started from England, and Robert Law knows this and, uh, about Patrick Moore. He started, Marty, a program called Sky at Night. All right, here's some of Patrick Moore's uh, teaching you what craters are all about, what caused them, spacecraft that went there. Patrick Moore started a program, I think, in 1953 on television called Sky at Night. It is the longest-running TV show on the history of mankind. You believe that? Well, believe it. An astronomy program, Sky at Night, on the BBC, is the longest running program. Still airs once a month, or once a week, I believe. And you might see Queen guitarist Brian May on there. Because he, when uh, Mr. Moore died, he, he took over and did some of the... Uh, co-hosting of it and uh, Brian May the guitarist for Queen is a doctor of astronomy and his specialty is asteroids particularly asteroids that could hit the earth or strike or uh, and you look at the moons just a shooting gallery there of things that have hit it all right well to show you a little bit about we can't talk about the moon and not talk about a, a pile of rocks that were brought back from the moon can we Marty after all, Marty worked on the lunar module with Grumman, and uh, uh, we always love talking about the Apollo landings on the moon. And you can look at the moon and find your own location 
uh, with a map, of course, it'll tell you where all the landing sites were. And then it's fun to find them and make a sketch, a photograph, or just memorize it in your eye that you're looking at the area from Earth 250,000 miles away where astronauts landed six times during the Apollo moon program of the night from 1969 to 1972. And uh, we, of course, is a celebrate the landing on the moon every chance we get. That was President Kennedy shown here at our wonderful Space View Park. That was his challenge to our country to go to the moon before the end of the 1960 decade. Why? Because it will make us a strong country. We will invent things that we know, we don't even know what we need to invent along the way. And, of course, it will look good in the eyes of the world that we did it in a peaceful way. And we did it. And hopefully Artemis program will take us back there in two or three years. But I am a little edgy that before Artemis gets there, we might have a man and woman from China get there first. Uh, just, uh, just saying, okay. Keep your eye on those Chinese in their moon thing. So we've been on the moon. We've seen the, the liftoffs and landings on the moon. These are all the places on the moon that humankind has dumped its trash, so to speak. Uh, some of these areas, uh, uh, the, loon, the green ones are the Russians, the yellow ones are the Americans, okay? The, the yellow are the American landing sites. The uh, blue are the uh, American uh, landers. So they don't have rangers there. The, the rangers were kamikaze uh, spacecraft that crashed into the moon. I figured up one time there's something like about uh, 300, uh, no, over, maybe like 300,000 tons of human debris is on the moon because we also took that third stage of the Saturn rocket, the S-14, or S-4B, and crashed them into the moon, too. So, But those are all of the soft landings by Russia, Luna 9. Uh, they had uh, three or four rovers on there. Two or three of them actually brought back samples that they drilled in and then sent it back to Earth. So we've got over 950 pounds of moon rocks. And um, 950 pounds of moon rocks. Let's look at our moon guys on there. Oh, we're, we're, we're missing those guys. Okay, there we are. I got my pictures done, though. Uh, and there is John Young with the only telescope taken to the moon, an X-ray telescope, rover in the back. There's the lunar module there. It's Apollo 16. Uh, but we've seen and watched humans on the moon to where it got boring. And when Apollo 16 was on the moon in April of 1972, and then... The finale of Apollo 17 in December 1972, public apathy was at an all-time high. There was, of course, no social media or 24-hour news channels that could have the videos going constantly. Uh, so you had to have special uh, to, to see the actual moon walks going on. But, but every seven hour, they had three seven-hour moon walks, the last two missions. In 21 hours of broadcasting them back, and nobody watched it. And there was hardly any place to watch it. But now you can watch it, of course, in uh, online at various sites on there. But just a great shot of thinking about humanity on the moon and then leaving the moon as one of those rovers was parked a couple thousand feet away. The camera on it was, a, was a controlled by Houston. And we watched the ascent stage of the two-part lunar module lift off from its descent platform backwards got those mixed up we should have that one and then away we go up there yep and so 12 men walked on the moon can you name all 12 of them which of these 12 are alive glad you asked let's take the top row of four who's alive up there marty Nobody wants to use our UCAC microphone today. You've got, of course, the first, and this is in order of, from Apollo 11 on down. So you got Neil Armstrong, passed away, Buzz Aldrin, 92 years old. Then the next two gentlemen at the top, P. 
Pete Conrad, Charles Pete Conrad, and Alan Bean, buddies for life from the Navy. They are both passed away. Left two in the center. The black and white is of uh, Alan Shepard, our first man in space, and Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14. They have both passed away. Edgar Mitchell is a great friend of the American Space Museum, and Alan Shepard also helped this museum in the beginning. So the other two guys you got there in the center, big smiling uh, Dave uh, Scott, he is alive. I believe Dave Scott is 89 or 90 years old now. And that is Jim Irwin. And Jim Irwin, unfortunately, was the first moonwalker to pass away over 20 years ago of a heart attack. Very religious man, Jim, Jim Irwin, too. It changed his life going to the moon. He spent the rest of his life looking for Noah's Ark and the... Uh, uh, the, the, the the scrolls or of the or tablets of the um, uh, commandments. All right, bottom row, the bottom four there. So we've got Buzz is alive in the top row. We've got Dave Scott's alive. Bottom row, left, the great John Young, Apollo 16, and Charlie Duke. John Young passed away a little over two years ago, and Charlie Duke is alive and healthy at age 89. And then the final two, that is Gene Cernan, who has passed away. Kind of weird-looking picture of Gino, isn't it, Marty? Yeah. For me, it is. Yeah, a little bit. And, uh, and then uh, Harrison Jack Schmidt, the, the 12th man to walk on the moon, and he is alive and well at age 87 years old. So those are our moonwalkers. And yes, I'm taking time to acknowledge them. Every school kid should know them by heart, in my opinion. And all six moon landing dates should be national holidays. Take that. So we've got a comment, Marty, question on the UCAC microphone. Yeah, Connie yeah, doesn't know how to use, use it, it yet. Yeah, I know. She knows how, but she won't. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, Dean Babcock, what would have been the longest that Apollo crew could have stayed on the moon? Dean, Dean Babcock. Babcock. Now, that is a good question that only Mr. Winkle can answer accurately. Marty, those uh, uh, the, those consumables were pushed up for 15, 16, and 17, the last three solid days. Uh, what's your answer? Well, three days. Three, three days? days? I mean, you talk about whole days. You, know, you maybe could have extended a few more hours, but not a whole lot. You definitely weren't going to go to four days. Yeah, no. it's a little bit over three days. Uh, is that, and, and probably with consumable, most important would have been the oxygen, correct? Right, oxygen and water. And water, and the oxygen was in about a basketball size uh, uh, sphere. I've seen the I've seen it in the pictures with the skin taken off. About basketball size, Marty. Probably a little bit bigger than that. A little bigger than that, or I would make a big, little beach ball size, yeah. maybe. And uh, but for for two men to be alive on that, and then recharge also their their uh, spacesuit uh, uh, things on there. So good, thank you for that question there. But yeah, three days they would they did not want to push that fourth day at all. And then there have been some consumables uh, on the command module too of it orbiting, but that wouldn't have been as critical. But thank you, we got you thinking there. A box of rocks is what we brought back for $40 billion, some non-advocates of the space program might say, but uh, uh, you change that name on the bottom yeah. there. All right, there we got Margo, Denise. Well, we got Denise there because she's moon water, and I'm going to be drinking some moon water here in just a minute. Uh, she's the entrepreneur for moon water. But there's an idea of a good collection of moon rocks, okay, uh, those are two millimeters across, okay? So the biggest ones in that pile are no more than two inches, an inch or so on there. And they're all kind of on a grid, and you see kind of different colors. Don't look too much different than your rocks in uh, a, a park driveway or something. And we've got a question. Yeah, from Mark Usiak. Uh, moving module question for me. Uh, how did the ascent stage exhaust bent out of ignition did it blow out the side panels of the descent stage well it blew out if you ever looked at the um, uh, painting that um, oh gosh um, Alan Bean did 
Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, uh, it, it's a good rendition of it. It shows the particles. It doesn't show the exhaust, but it shows the particles from the acid stage and descent stage going in all directions. The descent stage above the descent engine had some mylar coverings over that that acted as a deflection field of debris to go in all different directions. The only damage happened to the aft end of the uh, ascent stage. There's some pictures out there, and you can see the buckling of the whole back of the ascent stage. Uh, and that happened from the Apollo 11 on up. Uh, and it probably happened to Apollo 9's uh, uh, 11 3 also, I'm not really sure. Uh, and probably uh, um, 11, 5, 11 4 from Apollo 10. But there are pictures from the. Uh, uh, Lifting off the moon, you see the damage to the, I'll say the skin, the aluminum outside structure covering all the uh, batteries and a lot of the electronics of the ascent stage. Good answer. Good question there, Mark Usiak. Um, but uh, yes, and uh, when you have to go out to the Kennedy Visitors Complex, the Saturn V Center, you can see the back. Marty pointed out, we showed it one day on Stay Curious. Uh, that there is a an open area for that exhaust to vent out also that way. So, uh, but yes, I have had my hands on a couple moon rocks. All right. Uh, very briefly <laughs> there, my great friend, Paul Lewis, there saying, Marquette, give me back that rock. Uh, Paul is an educator at the University of Tennessee, and he has carried this rock with him for over 20 years. It's in a little... Uh, lucite acrylic uh, cube, and that is a white rock that was harvested during the Apollo 16 uh, spacewalk there. But, you know, I say get inspired by the moon any way you can. And one of our new great friends at the American Space Museum, Mr. Chris Calley, welcome, Chris, to Stay Curious in 2023. This is Chris's final look at the Apollo 17 uh, moon landing 50 years ago, Chris Cowley's tribute with uh, the last boot print, the rover, the flag. Uh, there's only one thing missing, Marty, the lunar module. But that's okay, Chris. We love this. What a, what a, what a wonderful artist he is. <clears throat> he is a second generation artist. His, his dad, Paul Cowley. We're going to be, be inspired by him in just a minute. But uh, thank you for sharing this, Chris, an exclusive look at this on Stay Curious. He did post it on Facebook, and Chris is uh, getting his website restructured, so we'll tell you in the future where you may own this print of the Apollo 17 tribute by the wonderful and very talented artist, Mr. Chris Cowley. And that gives me a chance to uh, brag about a couple of my, well, there's one of my photos, uh, my artsy look at the moon. When you photograph the moon, uh, you need to photograph it for the dark areas so you can see those dark areas. Otherwise, the moon just looks like a flashlight in the sky, okay? And uh, this is, a, uh, you professional photographers know it's not easy to balance the twilight like this palm tree with the, the, the light of the moon, but there are certain times of the year and certain times of the uh, evening that you can do that, and I, that's what I tried to do. Well, be inspired by the moon, whether it's Jules Verne type of inspiration, where you create your own fictional story of going to the moon. There are still endless stories about the moon. It's a favorite uh, subject for to teach kids how to read and, and read stories. Hey, diddle, diddle, the cat and the fiddle. The cow jumped over the moon. Uh, but not only are we inspired by our, our, our wonderful science fiction writers throughout history, and Jules Verne goes back to the 1800s, all right. We're also inspired by to go to the moon in different ways. And back just a little hundred years ago, you had people that all aboard for the moon and they had a giant moon cannon that they were going to put a spaceship in or more correctly you in like a some sort of a capsule and then fire you off to the moon and uh, I love that and I, I love the, the from earth to the moon where Jules Verne uses um, uh, 
a anti-gravity paint uh, to go to the moon. I forget what they called that. And I was I just saw that movie the other day. Uh, maybe Dave Stangy knows that what they uh, called that in the movie. Um, uh, Jules Verne's Man in the Moon. Oh, gosh, it's going to come to me. So, not selenite. Those are the people they found. But Daniel DeYoung, glad that you had a great Happy New Year. Margot Watson, thank you for watching today, young lady. She was on with Denise Gibson last Friday as we talked about moon water. Oh, I just happened to have a little moon water here to wet, wet my whistle. Mm -mm. And we are going to get moon water to sponsor or stay curious, so get ready for that. Erin Lewis, she is up at the Kalamazoo Air Zoo in, in Michigan up there. Good to hear from you, Erin. Dean Babcock's watching. Leslie Day, Ophelia Sauterl. Ophelia, hope you see that big moon rising up over in a few hours. It's probably rising right now in France where she's at. Uh, Carlton Bailey, hey buddy, how you doing? Cynthia Rossi's here in town. Jessica Galloway, our Trekkie Techie's watching. So give us some notes. Tell us how we're doing, Jessica. And we couldn't have done it without her. And I'll just say that out flat out. Marty and I learned this Streamlabs. Connie's learning it. Uh, but we still are grateful that Jessica's on standby when we have a few hiccups because you don't do anything in social media involving live tele, tele TV or broadcast without something going crazy once in a while. Thank you, Jessica, for being there. Of course, with Robert Laws up in Dundee, Scotland, Corey Skinner, Steve Hammer, Cliff Watson, my buddy in Pomona, Australia, Cliff. How's everything going into Tuesday? We're having a good Monday here, buddy. So I hope you're looking at Mars and wearing it out there. So uh, he is above... Uh, 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 he's about in the middle of the state, I believe, or state, the country of Australia on the East Coast side there. So I've about talked myself out. I am so hungry. And you know what that means. Moon pie. Moon pie time. There's a moon pie. I've got a, uh, a, a blonde kind of moon pie I'll take a bite of there. Mm. Give me a little energy there. And, of course, wash that down. With some moon water. Denise Gibson, entrepreneur of moon water. We're going to love it and promote it. Mm. From artesian water source in the Shenandoah Valley. And this is, by the way, the first multi-planetary liquid. Denise Gibson, as I'm getting that moon pie out from between my teeth there. But the moon water, the moon pie, heck yeah, I'm inspired for a little moon shadow music. Throw on the 45 there, Connie. Put the needle down and let's dance to moon shadow there. There's other ones. Think of all, there's over a hundred songs with the, the title moon in it. From moon river, moon shadow, um, uh, Moon Dance is probably the most famous one of Van Morrison, Moon Dance. Marty, you thinking of a moon? Fly me to the moon. Fly me to the moon. That's right. Frank Sinatra. First played with Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. That's, yep, they played that on the moon there, and that's one of my all-time favorites. Uh, and how about art on the moon? And this is the great Paul Cowley's. Everybody's seen this stamp, and I'm so blessed to have uh, to know Chris, uh, his son, and Mr. Callie died about 10 years ago. His uh, space art is uh, some of the most premier out there. Robert McCall is another great space artist. They were contemporaries and kind of competed with each other. Uh, but also, uh, Mr. Paul Callie has a lot of Western art uh, with the uh, trappers, just phenomenal uh, artists this guy was. And uh, this is one of the more definitive pictures, uh, an idea copied by, uh, um, oh, who's the Saturday? Uh, I'm thinking of uh, the great. Um, okay. No, I'm thinking of um, uh, the Saturday Post. Yeah, no. uh, real famous uh, Rockwell, Norman Rockwell. Norman Rockwell kind of copied this. Callie's got another version of this called The Great Moment where you're kind of like 
like like a, a level of, of the moon on there and uh, should have thrown in a picture of uh, Doug Forrest uh, he's also a big moon uh, sketcher I'll make that up to you Doug could have put one of your pictures in here as that's his forte with pencil but I'll end our little stay curious stay star curious with my moon lunacy with showing you a couple of my favorite moon shots of all time and I distinctly remember driving down uh, 11W in Johnson City, Tennessee, and looking to my left and seeing the moon pass through this big structure. Of course, there, there are uh, power lines that were there. And I thought, ooh, that kind of has some neat symmetry to it. And I actually did a U-turn and then came down and had to go down an extra, you know, mile the other, the other way. And then uh, did a U-turn and then uh, pulled off the side of the road and framed it perfectly. So I hope that you enjoy this little uh, uh, electrically charged moon there. Then I covered the uh, NASCAR circuit, uh, three or four tracks and from Bristol, Tennessee. This is the Bristol Motor Speedway uh, when it was packed to the gills about 2010. And a night race going on with the moon rising over the South Holston Mountains in the distance there. Again, not an easy shot, you photographers, to balance all that light from the moon, the, the mountains, and the, the racetrack there. That's why you see the cars are a little bit fuzzy because it was a time exposure, probably about 30 of a second. On film, by the way, this was pre, I actually shot this pre-digital uh, uh, days. Uh, so even more difficult, but a, a moonshot nonetheless that I don't think anybody else has. And my final offering of the moon for our show today is the Hancock County Courthouse in my hometown of Finley, Ohio. And Marty, it's got to be five o'clock somewhere as we end Stay Curious today. And there it's five o'clock in Finley, Ohio. And that is John Hancock himself. And I've never really figured out why John Hancock, who I think is from Pennsylvania, ended up in Finley, Ohio, and so revered there. Uh, that's something I got to dig in a little bit deeper. But notice, you see the Maria there. You see Mer Mercrism, Sea of Serenity, Sea of uh, Tranquility there, uh, as John Hancock is, is mirrored there. And it's 5 o'clock somewhere. Well, Marty, we know, Marty and Connie, we know that we're going back to the moon. All right. We know that that's going to happen, and Elon Musk is, wants us to take us back to the moon in this starship. This is the spacecraft that has been okayed to go to the moon, all right? And this is going to be on the other side of the gateway when they go down to the moon. And uh, so, Marty, you know, what they're, you know what they think they're going to find on the moon when Elon Musk lands his starship? I know exactly what they're going to find. They're going to find Alice Cramden there. All right. And those of you that don't know who Alice Cramden is, well, you got to watch The Honeymooners, one of the oldest sitcoms with Jackie Gleason and uh, poor uh, Audrey Meadows uh, being yelled at and threatened, I'm going to send you to the moon, Alice. And so there they are on the moon. So... Hope that you've enjoyed our stay star curious today. What do we got going on there, I wonder? Some sort of anomaly there, but that's all right. We're just, we're, oh, the binoculars, the microphone, something's going on here. But we've got, the moon is being blotted out there, okay? And, uh, 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 but uh, that's all right. We're, we're here at the end of our program, and we'll figure that out for tomorrow's show. But I am very grateful for everybody being on our program today, watching our show today, kicking our new week off. We, after all, are going to have um, um, our regulars on this, uh, this month. We got Hugh Harris lined up at 90 years old. He'll be with us next Wednesday. Uh, to give, and as we kick off space shuttles of January, 10 space shuttles of January, we'll be looking forward to Mikey Haddad talking about payloads, as he's one of the payload managers for 30 years on the shuttle. Terry White will be joining us, as Terry will be uh, talking about the shuttle garages. All right, and, and then 
Uh, he's going to take a break in January, but we'll have him back in February. Nick Thomas, thank you for adding to our Stay Curious program. So until we kick things off tomorrow again with the shuttles of January, there's 10 of them. All right. And uh, we're, we take the high road with the tragedies and celebrate all of our wonderful shuttle astronauts for things that they've done to improve our society. So thank you, Marty, and thank you, Connie, for doing a great Streamlabs job there. And until tomorrow, I'm Mark Marquez saying I can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us. <laughs>